Hey, what's up, guys? Oh, so you thought we were done with the Cabbage Babies? Nah, we're just getting started. And sure, I know some of you think we're obsessed with this topic, but it really has nothing to do with that. It's something that no one is really deep diving into right now, and we truly believe that there's something to this and a connection between Cabbage Patches, Orphans, and Cloning. Now sure, you can try and say that we're stretching the truth or making something out of nothing. That the postcards were just a means to get around the taboo topic of talking about sex in the Victorian age. But honestly, that's kind of nonsense. So you're saying it was too taboo to talk about sex, but it wasn't taboo to have a bunch of naked babies in cabbage patches with text literally saying for sale and also postcards that are telling you this has to do with repopulation or even babies being boiled in a cauldron. No, that's perfectly normal. Talking about sex was just too out there for our ancestors. Right. It's only a few people, but they're probably not even watching the content fully or just really hate this subject for some reason. But yeah, like I said, we're going to continue anyways because this connects with everything. From Tartaria, to resets, and yes, even repopulation and cloning. Now, what further backs this up is the fact that there are other forms of media that see the exact same symbolism. Today, we're going to be discussing a really weird movie, like, I don't know how to describe it, it's so freaking weird. Maybe the weirdest movie ever. Well okay, not the weirdest movie ever, it's not holy mountain level weird, but it has to be in the top 10, I mean I'm telling you. We're gonna break down this movie and all the symbolism, and then connect it with all of our research on the subject, which will be super interesting. This film is called Patch Town, and it's from 2014, so this isn't recent or anything. Someone figured this stuff out almost a decade ago and turned it into one of the most bizarre fever dreams of a movie that I've ever seen. So yeah, with that, let's go ahead and get started. First off, the movie is Canadian and it was originally an award-winning short film before it became the full-length movie. The film was directed by Craig Goodwill, who took inspiration from Russian folklore where babies are born in cabbage patches. So. This is based on Russian legends which seem to also have inspired the overall aesthetic of the factory and town where these cabbages are grown in the movie. The idea of children being born from cabbage patches is not unique to Russia but is also found in other Eastern European folklore. The movie starts with an old vintage clip called A Toy's Journey, an American success story, which is kind of where it makes its first parallels to the Cabbage Patch Kids and successful marketing of a product. Strangely, it says that this announcement is brought to you by the purveyors of the finest cabbage vodka and the bottles have a double-headed eagle or phoenix on them which could represent Russia but I just found it weird. This is where we learn about Patch Enterprise, which is the nation's leading toy manufacturer. They produce many different toys, but there is a secret to their success. Innovation. Innovation in science manufacturing, and the finest organic ingredients, where it shows a video of people harvesting cabbages. Um, wait, what? These are delivered straight to our customers, all around the nation. Then it says, how do we keep our prices so low? Well, that is the Patch Enterprise secret, as the voice starts to distort and glitch. Okay, so just a fair warning, it starts to get dark really fast, so hopefully you guys are prepared, but... Just another warning, there's some really weird stuff about to happen. Next scene, we get a 3D composite of Patch Town's factory, and there's a communist logo, a fenced-in plot of land with a massive field of cabbages, and there's also what seems to be multiple storks flying around on their way to deliver these babies. The next shot opens to the interior of the factory where the employees are at work with a conveyor belt that's moving cabbages down the line. This is where we get introduced to the main character, and a flashback begins, some type of memory. In this memory, there's a little girl and a record of adoption. The song in the background is a song that starts with Mon Petit Chou, a well-known phrase in French that means My Little Cabbage, which is supposed to be a form of endearment. In this instance, the girl is singing this song with this phrase to apparently a doll. So obviously, this doll meant a lot to her but she basically is singing to it and calling it My Little Cabbage and showing how much she cares about this thing. Then we hear a, John, wake up. It must have just been a dream. 
John works in this factory and is obviously bored due to the repetitive nature of the factory, or perhaps some form of escape. An employee on the other side woke him up to save him as if he would have got in trouble if he was caught sleeping. John then resumes his work and the next shot shows a cabbage being cut open and a goo-like liquid starts dripping from the dissection. He then shoves his hand into the cabbage which apparently represents a womb and he just performed a c-section or cabbage section and then he yanks out what appears to be a premature baby. He raises it up and starts performing this weird thing where he cleans the baby with his other hand and we can also see that there's an umbilical cord connected to the cabbage. Then he sprays the baby with the hose as the crying continues. Apparently, this is a factory where babies are literally pulled out of cabbages as clones, meaning they were born artificially, no mother. Now after cleaning the baby, he ties a rope around the feet strangely, and then he pulls a lever which drops a chain with the hook to where now he can attach the crying fetus with its legs tied to the hook while it's hanging upside down, which let's consider the esoteric symbolism of the hanged man. He then moves on to the next cabbage to repeat the entire process again. So that took roughly under one minute, but let's just say it took two minutes to dissect a cabbage. So that's one clone every two minutes, and let's just say he's working an eight hour day. How many clones a day would that be? Let's just say he has a total of 30 minutes of break time a day. A single worker would be outputting around 225 clones a day. So hold up. What happens to these clones? Well, the next scene starts and we hear a buzzer. It seems work is done for the day. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, this movie randomly starts becoming a musical like out of nowhere and then randomly stops. I don't know, I found it really weird, like it rhymes? I'll mention this later, but yeah, that's part of what makes this movie so bizarre and surreal. But it's also kind of bad, well, not necessarily, I like John's parts, but the parts with the bad guy, it just made no sense. It's as if it was trying to be Dr. Seuss, but then there's no real structure. It just starts randomly rhyming and stopping with no clear format. I don't know, it's just really weird. Like we just watched a cabbage get stabbed with this dark tone and then all of a sudden it becomes a Broadway show? Anyways, Patch Enterprise prohibits singing, but he continues as we see multiple employees working and John is singing about how he knows this isn't his family. As he sings, we get this reality of what this dark place is. It's a factory for growing or cloning babies. We see all the workers who are doing this as they perform the exact same procedure as John. Look, I told you this was going to be a weird movie, and it gets much worse. This is just setting the entire stage. If you're new to the channel, by the way, Part of the reason this is so strange is because of the history of the cabbage patches and postcards and its relation to baby incubators and orphan trains. We will discuss this towards the end, but if you want to understand the full context of this review and breakdown, I highly suggest you check those out first. Basically, John dreams of stealing off into the night. He has a feeling that something isn't right, he doesn't belong to this place. So the employees are leaving work and it becomes apparent that there is some tight security. A speaker gives a reminder that all cabbage are the property of Patch Enterprise. If they are caught with the cabbage, then there will be serious consequences. Oh, and as this announcement is going on, they get checked by security, they get weighed and scanned, and each one of these employees have a barcode or mark on their forearm. But oh no, someone got caught. It seems that one of John's friends, another employee, was trying to escape with the cabbage. He looks at John for help, but John just stands there in silence. So hmm, people are trying to escape with cabbages for some reason? This causes the main antagonist or bad guy to come in and he takes the cabbage after his crew beats up this guy. Then they take him away as the guy with the hat confiscates the cabbage property. We then get another shot of the factory to see the massive scale of this creepy place, and we zoom out to the town that John lives. John goes home to his wife, and it's obvious that John is torn up about what happened at work. The reason is because, well one, he knows he doesn't belong, and two, that guy who got caught was trying to steal a cabbage after he told him not to steal it from the line. This worries him because John and his wife Mary 
are secretly taking care of a baby that was birthed from one of these cabbages. But instead of going through the system, they took in the child as an orphan. It wasn't birthed by them, it was birthed by the cabbage, so that still would technically be an adoption, which is what we find out later. So yeah, they have a baby that they keep under the floor, and they have to keep it a secret. Mary's happy. She's like, I'm glad you did nothing. We have to take care of this baby, and she's completely happy with her life. But John is depressed, and he needs answers. He feels like this whole situation is dangerous and that they live in fear constantly. He doesn't think that this is his home, and he has a good point. But Mary's like, what is with you? To her, this is him acting weird. He's basically waking up and she's completely stuck in the matrix of this reality and completely fine with it. This is just how it is and you should accept it. What I find weird is that Mary's like, we knew what we were getting into when we got this baby, or Daisy. So what's going on here? Can people not reproduce in this town? Why do they want to steal cabbages so bad for babies? Then he starts singing to the baby the Mon Petit Chou song from the dream earlier. So they both really care about Daisy, and Mary tells John that he needs to go visit Boris because he got them this baby and they need to give him a final payment. The next scene opens with John getting cabbage vodka at some bar while a Polish woman is singing a song about cabbages growing. John has come here to meet up with what seems to be like a gang or mafia leader or something and gives this guy the payment. So they sit to have a conversation and we learn John's not sleeping too well, but Boris tells him, yeah, the first few months can be rough. We find out it's not the baby causing him that much stress, it's more so that he's having these dreams. So he explains the dream and says, I'm crazy, right? But Boris looks at him surprised, like, no, you aren't crazy. Boris opens the drawer and then pulls out a private file. He hands John a record of adoption, and the photo is the girl from his dream. So we find out that Boris has guys inside of the factory, and he's arranging adoptions for people secretly behind Patch Enterprise's back. So they have a back file on each employee that wants a kid for adoption. And then Boris says that they do these background checks to make sure that you aren't a pervert, which is a really weird thing to say. We find out that this girl from the photo is actually John's mother. Yeah. Basically, this guy Boris is about to break John's reality. John is an employee that works at Patch Enterprise, our main character, is also a clone himself. Let me break this down. This whole patch town is a town of clones, where basically babies are grown from cabbages and then turned into dolls. You will learn how in a moment, but this girl from the dream with the doll is actually holding John, our main character, when he was a doll. In the file, we see there's an older woman, and he's like, who is this? Well, basically, the girl grew up and abandoned the doll, and when the doll is abandoned, then they get confiscated and brought back to Patchtown, apparently to serve as workers for producing more clones to be turned into dolls, continuing this horrible dark cycle. Boris is one of the few characters who is aware of this process, and he begins to explain this hidden truth of their world. So that's basically the main premise of this story, but how is that possible? Well, we actually get this whole backstory. A new shot opens with what seems to be the same landscape and area as Patch Enterprise. Boris tells John a story about how this land used to be owned by an old Russian toy inventor named Gregor, where one night he heard a bunch of babies crying out from deep in the woods. He had children himself, so concerned, he goes out to find out what this noise was and if the babies needed help. He then stumbles upon a cabbage patch where he finds that a baby was born and crying for help. Confused, he looks around and sees another baby being born from a cabbage. Boris then says that little did he know that in saving us from the forest, so saving us, so Boris is telling John, hey, we came from the cabbage patch, and this man who's trying to save us, little did he know what the consequence of this would eventually become. We find out that Gregor lost his wife, and so he felt the need to protect these babies. But basically, he already had a son, or it says he loved us like we were his own, again showing that they both came from the same cabbage patch. 
So the toy inventor brings all these babies in and we're introduced to the son Yuri, and he's not happy about this. He did not approve of getting all these siblings and he didn't want any part in it. He wanted his father all to himself. So the toy inventor realizes that he can't just keep all these babies and that they needed homes. So what he does is he makes a strange Victorian invention that would transform the babies into dolls. The way he puts it is that the inventor built a machine that froze the babies in time. We find out that when this transformation happens, that they're still alive, or he says we're still alive, still aware of their surroundings. So basically, after they're converted into dolls, they're still alive during this whole process. That's why he has the dreams. It's not a dream. It's a memory from when he was a doll while being a baby and that child is his adoptive mother. This is what made a little girl's dream come true. These dolls were actually real babies. And we see the stork symbolism again as this turns into the nightmare that it is today. So eventually the little girls grow up and then the dolls are abandoned and forgotten. So Yuri with the bag like Santa is sent out to collect and bring the dolls home. And he's a little older now too. So they return home and the toy inventor set about a way to try making us a part of a family. Well, Yuri has had enough of this and is like, I almost got caught by these people. They think that I'm stealing their actual children instead of these useless dolls. But the inventor with the crazy look is like, no, they're your brothers and sisters. So in this case, it's obvious that the father has an obsession with this and Yuri is realizing he's going insane. Well, Yuri gets angry and starts to try to rip the dolls apart, and the father's like, no, no, you're hurting them. I fixed the machine. But Yuri's done, and the father is getting too old and hurts himself in the process of trying to stop him from hurting the dolls. So the inventor falls and dies, I guess, and then passes the responsibility to Yuri to take care of the dolls, or cabbage babies. Yuri's really upset about all this, and we find out that the machine works in unfreezing the children from the doll state. We hear the baby crying, showing that the conversion was successful. I know, it's really weird. So yeah, they're born from cabbage, turned to dolls, then adopted, then they're collected or stolen, and then converted back to human to continue as part of the family. And in this, Yuri seems to get a dark idea on what to do. This is partly because he blames the cabbage babies for the death of his father. So yeah, that's kind of the backstory, and we learn that Yuri is the guy with the black hat from earlier who confiscated the cabbage at security. He turned his father's creation into a product that would be sold around the world. Obedient workers served his every demand? Why? Well, it's telling you, these are clones. These are the babies that were born from the cabbage patch, and then after, they're dolls, they come to work at the factory. But it gets worse. They keep this entire truth hidden and wipe the memories of the dolls after they're converted back. So they get their memories wiped. But John obviously is lucky because he's the only one who has a memory of this happening. Which leads us to this entire story of the history of Patchtown. John asks him how do you know all of this? He shows him a scar and says that it took some time for Yuri to perfect the conversion process and that he was his first prototype. Then they start talking about the memory stuff, so perhaps Boris did not have his full memory wiped or it was more difficult to get the first ones to follow the new program, but the memory wipe is for the purpose of giving him the belief that this is all life has to offer. So they are mentally programmed for this industrial cabbage production factory and they themselves went through this process. John is curious as to why he can remember, and Boris says that it's due to fate. John's like, um, okay, so can I get out of here? And Boris hands him a card saying that there's a shipment going out tonight. If John wants to leave this place, he has to meet up with this delivery guy. But then John is questioning whether it's going to be more dangerous out there or staying here. And Boris tells him that it's much more dangerous out there. And I find that really interesting because there are some certain tie-ins that aren't so direct, but they will keep repeating that it's actually far more dangerous in the real world. John heads home and is like, Mary, pack your bags, we're leaving, we gotta get out of here. And remember, she already thought he was being weird, she isn't just going to accept this truth immediately, so she doesn't really understand any of this. She says, I need to get back to work at the factory, 
and she also has her own number so she's also a clone. They hear a noise outside and realize security is checking houses for other potential cabbage thieves. With this as a warning, Mary is realizing that they are at risk because of the baby. Yuri comes out with the baby and starts one of these weird musicals. It's kind of like a mix between singing and then talking randomly in rhyme. Super strange. But he basically takes his baby from a family who adopted it, but this is Patch Enterprise property. So he takes the baby and literally just drops it in a trash can. He calls it Rotten Cabbage. Then he starts singing again. Then Mini-Me comes in, and this guy's extremely strange. I'm not sure if he's Yuri's homunculus, but they wear the same outfit. He's probably the funniest character, not really, he's also super creepy and just weird. If you get caught breaking the law, you get sent for re-education. They're literally telling you. The clones that wake up, break the laws, or whoever doesn't go with the program will be bagged, taken, and then sent to a re-education room that features a device with screens that wipe their victims' memories. Yeah, and right when they're doing this, Yuri breaks out into a full-on musical out of nowhere. I mean, with full-on dancing, even the couples being arrested. Just totally caught me off guard, just saying. Then Daisy starts crying, and so they run away from the window, but Yuri heard the crying. John's like, okay, we gotta dip. They run off to go meet with this delivery guy that Boris told him about, and it's a very peculiar Indian man who asks them for a password. They get into the car to be taken to the real world or outside world. There's then this scene where Yuri goes into Boris's office to grab the file on John and his previous owner or mother. Yuri's trying to find out where John is going and then he takes Boris to make him forget or in other words, re-education. John is on the road and sleeping and starting to remember what happened. His mom, the doll owner, grew up and abandoned him. We then find out that the driver figured it all out and he knows that he's a clone but that he never had a mother because he wasn't a popular model. It seems that John has this urge to actually meet his mother as an adult. Now keep in mind, she has no clue about all this. Oh yeah, and then there's this really weird part where he figures out what candy is and just starts freaking out and it seems like he starts tripping or something. So back at the factory, they're having this whole meeting over this. This whole scene's just weird. Um, so he gets the board directors to fire each other. They need more black hoods. The tiny guy starts talking about people, animal rights protest on the storks. And then there's this PR nightmare that they're too outdated and all this stuff. But they want to pop their customers' faces. And then this is one of the weird rhyming parts that I was talking about with Yuri just randomly starts rhyming because he wants to make a new type of product for older kids, which will require their device to transform larger humans. He wants his first prototype to be the girl from John's file. This girl is the daughter of his mother who is now fully grown up. After finishing his cringe rhyming, he says, any news on the escaped foundling? So they're calling John the clone an escaped foundling. John is brought into the city and upon exiting the vehicle, we see a logo that says Sly's Fresh Produce, which is very strange. So wait, he's actually delivering cabbages. What else would it be? It's not just dolls that have been converted. That's extremely weird. So what ends up happening is that Sly provides John with a simple house and a job. But this is also kind of weird because John gets a Santa Claus job and he gets in line with a bunch of other Santas, so you start to see this juxtaposition between the horrible Cabbage Factory life and this new life where they have no electricity or heat, and this job of being essentially a clone of Santa. And then it gets even stranger if you consider the Santa-Krampus connection with all of this. Krampus kidnaps the children and accompanies Saint Nicholas upon visiting children. So there's that stolen children theme that we'll see throughout the movie. This isn't just reaching because the entire point of all this is actually that this outside world is much more dangerous. So it's as if this whole factory is a symbolic play on the real world, just more fantastical. This feels no different from home, 
And also, Santa's a toy inventor, so they're definitely trying to connect the two worlds in that way. Okay, so yeah, this next part's weird. They're going to kidnap this daughter for their new model. And the short guy is giving this really weird speech on how they know this whole situation's messed up, but that they can't let it get in the way of their job. This is to help people, strangely. I don't know, he's basically trying to give a pep talk before doing this. Let's go snatch some kids. Oh, I won't eat them. So yeah, there's a few cannibalism references, not to mention the vodka from earlier, but yeah, they kidnapped this girl, which is the daughter of John's mother, from when he was a doll. Remember, she doesn't know any of this, but yeah, super creepy stuff. Well, there is a bit of comedic relief, and he gets beat up because the daughter knows kung fu, but still, it's just the subject matter and how it all connects once you ponder the actual history of this stuff. But then it just gets worse because he knocks her in the head with a trophy, so it's still pretty bad. Well, John is at work trying to get accustomed to his new job when all of a sudden the news comes on speaking of the kidnapping and showing a picture of his mother. John's like, that's my mom. We have to go see her. John goes home to tell Mary, and although Mary understands some things about the factory, she doesn't understand the whole doll adoption thing yet. So John tries to explain this to her and that he has to go find his mom or what he thinks is his home. Where Mary's like, but you already have a home. But John, which by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, I'm pretty sure his character design is based on the actual Cabbage Patch doll with the frill like that, but he's determined to go back to his mother, which I mean, what kind of storyline is this? So we go back to the factory where the small man brings the kidnapped child and he has this red stuff all over his lips where we find out he ate pickled beets. Which is just weird because it seems to be a play on blood being on his lips. But nope, it's just beets. And I guess that's comedic or something. He was actually supposed to kidnap the mother as well so that Yuri could forcibly marry her but he failed because the kid was too strong for him. So then John actually goes to his mother's house while the cops are there. And this part's pretty weird. So he goes to the door and is like, Bethany. And Bethany's like, do you know me? John says, do I know you? And then he starts recalling all this info from when he was a doll, like her crushes from eighth grade. And remember, Bethany, his mother, has no idea of any of this secret underworld. She's a full grown adult who had a doll or basically a cabbage patch kid there's no getting around that it seems that's what they're alluding to here but she doesn't know that the dolls were actually real people who were frozen in time so obviously she thinks this guy is some creeper weirdo well, the cops are like who the heck is this guy and arrest john and sly for the investigation john doesn't even know what cops are so he doesn't really understand what's happening and so he just tells them the truth but they can't even fathom this reality that he speaks of. I guess this is the FBI, and so Bethany comes in to ask him, where's her daughter? But John doesn't know, he just wanted to see his mother. He doesn't know what happened to his daughter. He tries to explain to them where he came from, but they don't understand. So he tells her, he's like, yeah, I used to be your doll, and you would pet me, and it seems that this really creeps her out because you have this full grown man saying that he used to be your doll, and she just got her daughter kidnapped, so yeah. But they're outside the interrogation room, and then John starts singing Mon Petit Chou, and she starts to remember. How could he possibly know that song? They end up just throwing him in a cell overnight, and we get another random musical, which I actually like this one, really touches you in the feels. So they let John out of jail because they had nothing on him, and then Bethany pulls up and shows John a drawing of that weird mini-me guy. Now John knows exactly where her daughter is. Now, he basically has to make a plan to go back to the factory and save the daughter. After finally escaping and getting out, he's going back. He's like, you gotta trust me. And Bethany puts her hand on his cheek, realizing that John really was her old doll. But first, he has to go get Mary and say sorry, and then convinces her to come with him back to the factory. But on their way to the car, Bethany actually gets kidnapped, so... Now they need to save Bethany and Avery. So we're back at Patch Enterprise and Yuri has prepared a dinner for his new wife Bethany that he forces to dress in a sexy outfit. So they sit down to eat and this is super weird. 
he says that they're eating cabbage rolls. Okay, so the first few times you could say that the cannibalism references weren't that blatant, but here now they're eating cabbage for dinner? And where do they get the cabbage from? Obviously, it's the cabbage from the factory, which is a womb, so this is basically babies. Take that how you may, this whole scene is very disturbing. Now Sly is taking them back to the factory and they begin their plan to infiltrate. They also brought a bunch of Santas to help. Oh, and here's another connection between the two. On their way to the factory, there are two signs in one pointing in opposite directions. One is to the North Pole and the other is to Patchtown. So there's definitely a connection between the two. They make it back into the factory and ask Daryl and Boris for help, yet it seems that they've been reprogrammed and set to work back at the factory. But they end up making it to the security room and Mary begins singing a song on the intercom to help the employees remember. And this seems to deactivate their re-education, or perhaps the songs help them remember. Basically, which explains how John remembers. Songs can go through the memory vibe, which, if remembered, will stimulate more memories. Back at dinner, Yuri's telling Bethany that they're about to start their lives together, and it may be smart if they have some replacement daughters because he's not sure if this whole conversion thing's even gonna work. He wants to literally make a mold from this child and then sell her likeness on the free market. While this is all happening, Bethany notices that John has broken into the factory from the security screens behind Yuri. So she decides to start playing along so that Yuri won't turn around and realize that a revolt is happening. I get it and all, but man, she switched up super quick. It did help, but still, kind of weird. Anyways, the small man tries to warn him, but Bethany has all of his attention. He finally turns around and realizes that they're coming for him and that Bethany was lying to him. Yuri gets really mad and is like, okay, now I'm throwing your daughter in the machine. Now John shows up to Yuri's lair and they have Avery all set up to this strange device. And I thought that this was a weird part of the movie, but there are no guns, which makes no sense to me. But yeah, John's like, just give it up, it's over. And then the Santas and employees show up too to help out with capturing Yuri. Yuri is keeping Avery hostage, and then it turns into this weird sob story where he did all this because he just wanted a family of his own. But they're like, uh, no, you don't always get what you want. And someone's like, what do we do with him? There's only one thing that they can do. And so they put Yuri through re-education to wipe his memories. So yeah, that's basically it. Everyone's happy, and we get this weird ending towards the end where the re-education device malfunctioned. Guess we may get a Patch Town Part 2 someday. But man, what a wild ride. Now consider this. Sure, you can say that it's just folklore, but what are the chances that someone else also sees the exact same symbolism? It can't be a mere coincidence. Factories making babies, genetic cloning, advanced technology, re-education, mind control, and orphans, adoptions. This movie came out in 2014, so this was almost a decade ago. I actually found out about it a couple weeks ago randomly while scrolling through YouTube and it showed up on the feed. I couldn't believe that we both had never heard of this movie after a year of looking into this stuff. So I'm guessing that most of you have probably never heard of it either. To me, the strangest part about all this is that it's not fantasy. Someone knew their symbolism here. And if you connect it with our other videos on this subject, from Alice Guy to the Cabbage Patch postcards from the early 1900s, it becomes far more disturbing. Cabbage people or NPCs doing this to create new cabbage people? I mean, what are the chances that there's a movie out there that discusses exactly what we've been putting together? but presents it as one of the weirdest movies ever to be made. Well, there is more to discuss. If you're interested in this subject, please consider supporting us by checking out our first book on the topic, The Cabbage Babies. There's so much more to this subject than just dark fantasy movies and folklore. It's one of the deepest rabbit holes that delves into the alternative history of resets, repopulation, and ancient cloning. Let us know your thoughts. And if there are any other movies, shows, or any form of media that may cover these references. Thanks for watching, 
and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?